Welcome to Lecture 5, Control System Design Using Frequency Response Methods. The objectives of today's uh, unit, uh, course uh, lecture is to learn how, via the frequency response method, to adjust the gain to uh, trade off uh, the transient behavior and the steady state behavior to meet the specifications of your system. So as you know, when you adjust the gain, you can move the closed loop holes about the root locus and uh, alter the, both the transient behavior and the steady state behavior. So usually what happens is, is, is the transient behavior improves, the steady state behavior uh, degrades, and uh, vice versa. So really the gain doesn't, can't help you uh, tweak the design, but it can't help you redesign the behavior of the system. In those sort of situations, we'll, we'll actually resort to using lead compensators to improve the transient response and lag, use lag com compensators to improve steady state response. Hopefully you'll be able to see the advantage of uh, some of these uh, techniques through Bodu plots, uh, gain and phase uh, contributions um, that are provided from the controller uh, as they're added into the plant response. Uh, very often it's uh, for real systems, especially if they're nonlinear, uh, the Bode plots are the easiest way to see what's happened. In some ways it's easier in the root locus, but with root locus you can see where the pole and the zero of, say, a lag compensator are placed, and so in some ways it's, it's very easy to see what's happening. But uh, with, with the Bode plots you see some sort of artificial change, and so it's less clear what's going on. With stability, in here we'll use Nyquist plots, in other words, those polar plots, with the Nyquist criterion, and it gives you a, a specific assessment of stability of a system. The Bode plots can also be used, but they're sometimes unclear. In all these cases, what we're doing is we're looking at the open loop system, GH, to assess the closed loop system behavior. You do not use the closed loop system behavior. You'll notice even in MATLAB that in, in this system, in MATLAB, you'll see something like this. A closed loop Bode plot. This isn't what we're going to be talking about. We're going to use GH to assess the closed loop system. So we're using all the behavior of the open loop system and we'll totally ignore behavior of the closed loop system in our plotting and what we're trying to determine is what that closed loop system would act like uh, with the open loop system and with the specific gain. As you remember the Nyquist plots is just a substitution of, of j omega n to s, uh, n for s into gh, so it's just a polar plot of g of j omega, j h of j omega. The Nyquist path um, means that j omega goes from minus j infinity to positive j infinity. So whenever we plot in the here's the real part of the s plane and here's the imaginary part and what we're looking at here is actually only Only this particular path here is important, and indeed it goes from minus infinity up here to positive infinity. So this is the source of our data, and so then S, S goes from minus J infinity all the way through to plus J infinity. Okay, So it's along this path, and if you remember right when we, we talked about the Nyquist path, it's actually a closed path. But it turns out that if you place um, the j infinity values, any of these j infinity values will be exactly the same. So this is the only part we have to worry about. The polar plot of g of j omega h j omega is the map of the Nyquist path to the, uh, to the gh uh, plane. So this Nyquist path is then conformally mapped to this gh plane. So if you have poles inside the Nyquist path, meaning the poles in the right-hand plane, 
then we end up with encirclements of this minus one point. Maybe it's unstable. In that case, we have to check the quality n equals z minus p equation. The number of encirclements is your n, and that's equal to the number of open loop poles in the right hand plane minus the number of closed loop poles in the right hand plane. So in this case, then the number of closed loop poles in the right hand plane, this is really what we're all talking about, is this is assessing the stability. The thing is, is that the number of encirclements, this comes from the Nyquist plot. So we have this. The z, number of open loop poles in the right-hand plane, that comes from gh. So we've got that. The p, the number of closed loop poles in the right-hand plane, we have to use this equation to find. It's what we're looking for. So in other words, p is equal to n plus z and plus this number. That's the idea. So let's take a look at this. Over here on the left hand side is the, this is the Nyquist. Of course this is the Bode over here. The uh, over here I should say. And then this is actually the time response. Okay, so we have Nyquist, time response, and Bode plots all in one picture. For a stable and well-damped system, we get a nice, we have a bit of an oscillatory behavior, but um, it damps out according to an input that's a step input here. If we look at the Nyquist plot, we actually have from omega, goes, uh, from omega zero all the way to omega goes to inf uh, infinity, we have it uh, come in like so, and if we actually draw the rest of this plot, should be symmetric, something like this. So it's coming in. And remember, the right-hand side of the curve is inside. All right, so the right-hand side, all of this is inside. Now, so this, this other part, when it's symmetric, we're just saying that this is the part that actually is from this little part in here, that's omega as it goes to minus infinity, and this is omega as it goes to zero. All right. So we look, how, how does this actually encircle minus one? It doesn't encircle at all. And so we notice that it has no encirclements of minus one. Okay, so there's no encirclements of minus one. And you notice that that corresponds to a stable system. And we have this uh, Bode plot here. I mean, what you want to watch is the phase and the amplitude, because um, it's not obvious at the moment, but it will be here in, the mo in a, a few more slides of what's happening. So let's look at it. As we um, make the system oscillatory and decrease the damping, for example, the Nyquist plot um, moves over here. You see the crossover point. It was over here in the previous plot, but it's actually moved to the left. And you notice that it's more oscillatory here. And you notice that this has come up a bit, and this, this, this slope is actually, is actually steeper here for the phase. The system is marginally unstable. Okay, it's marginally unstable. Notice that the slope is almost vertical. Our amplitude on the Bode plot at a particular frequency has gone uh, almost to infinity. Our response. Um, actually returns back to, to the zero value at uh, every, per at periodically. And our Nyquist plot actually crosses through minus one. Notice that if we, we plot the other part, all right, it still, crosses through minus one. Notice that the 
process through minus 1 here. Notice that it's almost encircling this minus 1 point, so you could say it's almost unstable, or it's marginally unstable. If we look at a completely unstable system, well, with, with regard to the time response, it's gone from being harmonic to actually uh, blowing out to give you a completely uh, divergent response. And curiously, this has the Bode plot has actually come back down. One thing you'll notice is, is that the phase shift is now positive rather than being negative. So rather than going down like this, it's actually gone positive. If we look over here at the Tanakwas plot, we originally had it over here at some value, then had another value, the marginally unstable. Now it's gone completely left of the minus one point to become, so the system has become unstable. And you might ask why. Well, if you look and see that, that this is for the positive values of omega, and remember if we have a symmetric plot for the negative values of omega, Nyquist plot is coming in, the right hand side is inside, and it's actually closed on the right hand side. So all of this is actually inside and if we trace a line in any direction radially like that you see that this is clockwise crossing and that that is also a clockwise crossing. So our number of encirclements is equal to 2 and it's not equal to 0 so our system's unstable. From the Nyquist plots, then, we can also see how stable systems are, not just whether they're stable or not. And we might imagine two ways to manipulate the stability. Um, we can increase the closed-loop gain, which tends to move this negative real axe crossing of G GH or J omega to the left towards minus 1, and increasing the instability of the system. And then rotate the GH uh, plot counterclockwise uh, about the origin to decrease its uh, stability. So, for example, if we have system. Here's our S plane. Okay, and we have, there's part of our plot. Here's the rest of it. All right, and imagine that, and here's your minus one point. Okay, so the system probably is stable. All right, depends on where the, zip, the poles are at, but it looks like it's probably going to be stable. It's closed over here on the right-hand side, and it's coming in, going out, and around. And what we can do is if we say if we increase the closed-loop gain, then this negative real axis, cr real axis crossing actually tends to move over left. So it actually, actually looks something like this. So it's moved over slightly. And if we keep doing it, like that and keep going on then you can drive the system unstable so the closed loop gain okay the closed loop gain k influences where this this point is at if we look at the rotation, then that's another thing that we can actually manipulate. You might think if there's there's at least the positive part of the of the plot. Well what if I suddenly rotated this whole plot something like like that and it's rotated around like so. The system has become more un unstable. So what we're doing is we're saying we're going to decrease its phase and it increases instability. You could actually rotate this plot around based on the input. This is only, this is the G of J omega, H of J omega. And what we can say is, is that we're going to increase the angle. Maybe here's our G, here's our H, comes in, here's response. 
And in here, we can say we put a new box and say we're going to change the angle. We're just always going to add an, a phase angle, and that's what we can actually do. And so when you put in, say, a certain value of S, this is actually S prime, and S prime has this part plus this angle um, where we've changed it, and the output response will be rotated around too. So that's one way to increase the instability and affect the so-called margin of stability. So there's two different ways to look at it. There's gain margin, and the gain margin is really related to adjustment of the gain so that it, it stays left, of stays right, I should say, of this minus one point. So the gain margin is, is basically this part here, wherever it crosses over to wherever the minus one point is at. If this is over on the left-hand side of this minus one point, it, says it is said to have negative gain margin. If it's on the right-hand side, it's said to have positive gain margin. You have some ability to add gain before the system becomes unstable. How much gain you can add depends on how far this point here is away from the minus one point. This particular point is called the phase crossover. Uh, and you determine that by using your angle criterion right here, where the angle of GH, of J, omega, whatever that might be, is equal to 180 degrees. If you solve this equation, uh, that's known. The only thing you don't know is omega P. Then you can figure out what the phase crossover frequency is, where this, where this whole system actually gives you the, an angle of 180 degrees. The gain margin, then, is is 20 log to the base of 10 to 1 over the magnitude of g j omega p h j omega p so once you have that phase crossover frequency that you can substitute in here and find out what your gain margin is in terms of decibels all right that's the reason for the log base 10 and 20 in the front the gain margin again is that amount of gain in decibels that can be added to the closed up system before it becomes unstable if the amplitude of GH is equal to zero, then the gain margin is infinite. So you can add all the gain margin you want, um, and the system will, won't become unstable. You might wonder, well, how can you do that? The one, the way to do it is that if if you have a system like this, and our Nyquist plot is like so, then as we increase the gain, we continue to move over like that but it will never actually cross the real axis on the negative side. And you can see if this is, say, maybe this is the minus one point, they'll never actually cross over the top over here on the left-hand side. And that's critical uh, for this kind, of, this kind of case. If you have a gain margin of between, um, if, the, if this crossover point, this g of j omega p, h j omega p, is between zero and one, the gain margin will be greater than zero. Whatever it is, I don't know, but it'll be greater than zero. Meaning that somewhere along the lines, that along the line here, it will actually cross over the minus one point as you increase the gain. And there is some finite difference, finite distance between this minus one point and the phase crossover point. So the difference between these is this one, it never actually ever crosses over. And this one, it does cross over, but it does so in between the zero and the minus one point. The next one is if that crossover is really actually at the minus one point. So if this phase crossover is at minus one, if that value is minus one, then you have no gain margin or a gain margin of zero. If on the other hand, your minus one point is actually to the right of the phase crossover point here, then your gain margin is is less than zero, so you have negative gain margin. Similarly, you can might imagine with the phase, what we can do, as you change the phase, all right, as you change the phase, then you can rotate the plot from, say, down here at A, all the way up here to B. And the idea is that this particular system is much more susceptible to, um, to becoming unstable by changing the input phase than this A system is because it's the angle here that you have available to you is very small, whereas the angle you have here is very large. The gain crossover frequency is the frequency at the gain crossover, and this is really from the magnitude criterion. 
remember on the previous slide with the with the gain margin, we used the angle criterion. Now we use the magnitude criterion. At these particular values of the gain, g h will be equal to one. Okay, and so if we we look for the frequencies, the omega sub g at which that happens via the magnitude criterion. The phase margin okay, is then this angle, okay, this angle of gh at this j omega g. So it's really this angle in here. Let's see if I can draw it. It's this angle, say for example, out to this point. We said we gave that angle you know, a value of alpha, say. And then we've got a hundred, another 180 degrees here at the top. So it's 180 degrees, and that comes from here, plus whatever this angle is, and that's like our angle alpha. So you have much larger gain margin here than you do in this other case. So A has much larger gain margin than B. The phase margin is the angle in degrees through which the Nyquist plot could be rotated until it goes through the minus one point, plus 180 degrees. So that's basically the idea. The gain margin is 20 log 1 over x in decimals, and the phase margin is just equal to phi. And this phi is associated with this, this, this minus 1 point here, okay, with a unit circle of 1. And this A is whenever the angle is at 180 degrees. And here's an example. We say we have GH of 2,500 divided by S times S plus 5 times S plus 50. Then our Nyquist plot would be as shown here. We'd have out here at a radius of 1, our gain crossover frequency would be 6.22 radians per second. And for the negative 180 degrees or 180 degrees of phase for our system, the phase crossover frequency would be 15.88 radians per second. Notice that we have a, the system stable, both in terms of phase and in terms of ga uh, crossover gain. And you notice that it is possible to make the system unstable by just increasing the gain because the crossover is some finite value between zero and one. And it's also possible to make the system unstable by changing the phase. So if we go through the phase margin, then if we do the calculations, then the GS um, is equal to one, then we get Again, it's 31.73 degrees, and gain margin is 14.74 degrees decimals. The phase crossover for these two values is about 15.88 radians per second, and the gain crossover is 6.22 radians per second. It turns out that we can find the gain and phase margins using the Bode plot, too, and in some ways it's more, uh, more straightforward to do. Uh, but the margins, the idea behind the gain margin and phase margins, it's you can't really define those in terms of a Bode plot, and they were never really discovered that way. They were discovered basically with the Nyquist plot. Here we go. A gain margin, and if it gets confusing, then look back at the Nyquist plot to see what all this means. If we look at our phase plot in the, in the Bode plot, and this is our uh, magnitude plot in the, in the Bode plot, then this region above zero dB is said to be unstable. You notice that this represents in the Nyquist plot, this is like the minus one point, okay? Um, because at minus one, at one, the value of one at 180 degrees of phase angle is that minus one point. Because it's one unit away at 180 degrees. So this represents the unstable region. This unst represents the unstable region. Let's see what we've got. We go through and we look at, if we watch how the, the response of the system run, goes down, goes down, you notice that it reaches a point to where it crosses over in terms of gain. If we actually were to plot this in a Nyquist plot, we're saying we're looking out here at a radius of, a radius of one. All right. And we're saying, I want to plot the Nyquist plot and see what it does, see where it goes, see where it goes. Okay, well, this is the point to where it crosses over our unit circle. This is the point where it crosses over our unit circle. So this is a zero dB of gain. That's a radius of one on the Nyquist plot. So as we keep going, it goes in farther and farther and farther and until it goes to negative infinity. Our, our decibel values actually decrease, decrease, decrease down to minus infinity. So 
we look at and we see we have we look at this and we see we well we've got a crossover here we have what is it a phase crossover at some point okay after the gang crossover here's your phase crossover remember there's a gang crossover your phase crossover gang crossover at some point later it's a phase crossover well at this at the gang crossover we have some sort of amount of angle that we can rotate this system we called it alpha before so this is actually the phase margin it's called there's our alpha plotted in here that's how much we could actually rotate the the input of the system in terms of phase before the system would become unstable if we kept rotating the input of the system this curve would move down and down until this point reached and then went on the unstable side for the for the phase crossover, if you remember, we could increase the gain or increase the gain. We don't have to do anything with the phase. We just increase the gain, increase the gain, and this curve will go over here to the left. So if we look, the curve, this is a minus one point. There's our minus one point, right? Here's our minus one point. This curve will go to the left, go to the left, go to the left, until it finally goes across and it becomes unstable. So the amount of gain that we have that we can get away with this at the phase crossover point, at this point which it crosses over, until it reaches the minus one point, that's related to this distance here. That's also related to the gain margin. So there's our gain margin. Realistically, it's easier to determine these values on the Bode plot. So gain margin is at a phase of minus 180 degrees, and phase margin is at a gain of zero dB. So try it out. First of all, what's the system type and what kind of plot would you expect from this system? Meaning, what kind of response would you expect from the system if you know the system type? So plot the polar plot, the amplitude of G um, and the angle of G. Try not to use the real and imaginary parts for the moment just to see what you get. Is it stable? Then what are the gain and phase margins of this system? You might also try the Bode plot and see. If you can read upside down, then you've got the answer. Another thing we probably need to talk about uh, before we go much farther is the second order systems because all of the systems that we talk about, um, we can have, if we look at the, the, the response of a system, we can actually um, look at them in, in a root locus plot and they might be very complicated. They might have a lot of poles and a lot of zeros and all of those things. But um, what we're going to assume is that these poles, for example, would dominate. And so it's a second order system. Always. Even if it's a 15th order system, we're going to presume that's a second order system. And so the magnitude of the closed loop transfer function and some of these things you can probably find from just, just using a second order system, um, peak responses and so forth. These are all things from the third year course that, that have been derived before for second order systems in particular. We're going to actually make use of some of these values for the design of our controllers. We have a bandwidth. Right, and we talk about the damping ratio and natural frequency of a second order system. The bandwidth is uh, given by this equation, omega sub n, the square root of one minus two zeta squared, plus the square root of four zeta to the fourth power, minus four zeta squared, plus two. Learn an equation, but we use that to, um, you can find that equation by finding the two, the two points where the magnitude m is equal to mr minus the peak amplitude, minus three dB in the closed loop transfer function on the mass on the last slide. And we can also define like a 2% settling time um, as 4 over omega n zeta and peak time response as well, which is pi over omega n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. So all of these things we can work with, and we can even show that the phase margin that's plotted in the Bode plot can be related to the damping ratio, and that's actually a rather involved derivation, and it's very specific to second order systems. So I don't think it's especially important to derive it, but it is in your book m by Mies, and the results are shown here. The phase margin is the inverse tangent of two zeta divided by the square root of minus two zeta squared plus the square root of one plus four zeta to the fourth power. Of course, you remember the second order system 
response is making it gets, gets larger, the pole distance. Um, in a second order system, it have just two poles, and presumably to keep it from being boring, you have two complex valued poles um, that will give you oscillatory response. So as mega n gets larger, the pole distance from the origin gets larger. As zeta gets larger, the angular distance from the mega to its real axis becomes uh, smaller. So you get all these different behaviors, so unit step response, and then here's our frequency response. So the idea is, is that a mega get, as a mega n gets larger, the, the rise time gets smaller and the system responds faster. And as zeta gets larger, the, the rise time gets larger and the system responds more slowly. Similarly, you know, the buddy plot, the frequency response, um, then as the mega gets larger, the bandwidth gets larger, and as zeta gets larger, the bandwidth gets smaller. So bandwidth and rise time are inversely proportional to each other. And the larger the bandwidth, the faster the system responds. Increasing the measured frequency increases the bandwidth and decreases the rise time. Increasing zeta decreases bandwidth and increases the rise time. So again, the bandwidth and rise time are inversely proportional. 